Thank you, Kevin. And yes, just I'm going to start by saying firstly that the research that I'm going to report on today is very much a collaboration. So this is work that is being done with Lee Webster, who's not here, but he works in the business school. He has started doing this project. Well, he started looking at the data that I'm going to talk about as part of his professional doctorate and is still doing that and has kind of taken this data set in a slightly different direction. But it was through his project that I became interested and started thinking, no, there's, I've been sitting on this gold mine of data for several years now. And I'm like, I've been sitting on this gold mine of data for several years now and we started looking at it for a variety of other things and this is what has come out of this. This is still work in progress so I am going to talk about some interesting things that have arisen but we are still working on this and the data are still going to um, be, you know, remain to be generated. So let me give you first a bit of background on what I am interested in which is summed up by that phrase and some things about the difficulties of researching the questions that I'm going to outline. I'll talk about the project and then we will come to the political and philosophical stuff about power and resistance which is where I can talk about Foucault for a while which is always fun and then some conclusions. Let me say a bit about why I'm interested in this kind of work though because both, well actually there are three reasons seeing as I've now you know, I am now the Director of Teaching and Learning Strategy here in MIE. I have, I have an overall strategic interest in the question of how do we help prepare students for the transition into employment? And that's really something that I'm most interested in. I, know I, am in, I, I think it's important to think about these ideas of information practice and information literacy and how I think universities have put a lot of work into this recently and the questions of how you help people transition into university. Because it's not just about what A-levels you've got, it's not just about what prior education records you have, it's not just about coming to university and learning the disciplinary content of your subject. It is about as well how do students, learners, become accommodated to the various different information practices and, and ways of making judgments and selection about what information is relevant and how to accommodate and enter the techni technological environment that has been created for them at university and all of the ways that they now have to learn, you know, things like study skills, thing, we call them that, things like how to find academic papers and so on and so forth. And this is an important transition. But I'm not as interested in that transition as I am interested in how we teach people and assess people, particularly, in ways that help them move from university into the workplace. Because workplace learning and the kinds of ways that you generate knowledge at work are not quite the same as the ways that we generally teach in universities. They involve different capacities and they are different forms of learning and they always will be. They always will be. And I'm not about to say either that I think what we need are much closer ties with industry because frankly I think we've got as much ties with industry as industry want us to have and uh, we have time to engage in. I think we have quite a few contacts in industry. What I am interested is in asking how as teachers in higher education can we understand the ways that learners are developing the capacity to engage in future workplace learning and the types of learning that are not just I'm talking here about corporations and you know industry and business I'm talking about the kinds of learning that help community sports clubs say develop a good information presence or you know collaborative work in the community of some kind so work I am defining very broadly here but generally you know those are some of the differences between your typical higher education environment I'm not saying they're all exactly like that but you and there are trends that higher education is generally more formal more individualized more stable more predictable and working Workplace learning is more fuzzy, more informal, less stable, more collaborative. When we are thinking about ideas of employability, therefore, which, as I said, is a strategic imperative for every higher education department, it's something I'm personally interested in and it's something I research, you know, the question, therefore, becomes of how are the practices in terms of 
students learning how to make judgments, critical judgments about the relevance of information. How are these practices developing in them while they are at university in ways that they can take forward into a variety of different professional contexts? Because writers that I'm, I've used a lot in my work and that I quite admire, for example, although she's not the only person who writes in this field, but for example, the Australian academic Anne-Marie Lloyd, who now works in Sweden, um, she comes up with this metaphor of the information landscape. The idea that the informational resources, the technological resources, but also informational resources as texts, informational resources as other people, as social networks, all of these things are things resources that can be useful to us as we seek to fulfill our learning needs. And Loy says, well, if you think about these things as configured around us, you know, in the way that the resources in a landscape are configured, you know, one thing we can do is learn to map and engage with these information landscapes in ways that allow us to map and navigate them and maintain them and sustain them and generally manage and look after them. And this is what she defines as this idea of information literacy. But I'm not really want to go into information literacy today. Um, that discussion happens elsewhere. What Lloyd does point out, though, is that these are very context-specific practices. And a lot of the things that are talked about digital and information literacy in universities are talked about in terms of the transition to university and how we help people make use of resources like the academic library. That's not ours, that's the Hoy School of Bergen in Norway, but it is a typical academic library, I'm sure you've seen plenty. Whether that is a digital resource as well, and Manchester does very well with its My Learning Essentials program, which is very good, and nevertheless, as I said, I would also like to think about how we can help people develop practices that rather than be oriented towards finding things in an academic sense and discovering and being able to learn, we need to ask questions like, well, how do these things emerge in contexts that might be quite different? I put the big bonfire there. There you go, Kevin. That's bonfire night. That was bonfire night in Hebden Bridge about three years ago. We were just talking about bonfire night. Anne-Marie Lloyd did her original studies with firefighters, and this was where her studies came from. So, and she said, well, you know, firefighters have deep and profound and often quite urgent learning needs, such as, is the ceiling going to fall on my head? You know, where are the people and do I have time to get them out safely? But of course, these needs are not generally fulfilled by going online and looking up some academic text or even going online and looking up some non-academic text. For Lloyd found that the firefighters developed information practices through observations of their more experienced colleagues as these guys and women move through spaces. So, you know, there was a lot of observational learning. There was a lot of, you know, training, obviously, was a place in which they developed this kind of knowledge. Anyway, any professional context, you know, that guy's my dentist, and yes, those are my teeth. And, you know, the kinds of practices, the kinds of ability to develop, continue to develop knowledge from one's interaction with a set and family of resources that one builds around oneself is an important skill for learning in the modern era in which we are, like it or not, having to prepare students more and more for what a colleague of mine, Stephen Goldstein, calls the gig economy. You know, you will go through your life having a series of gigs rather than necessarily getting a single job for the rest of your life. This is the way things are going. And how you present yourself online, how you build up a portfolio of work, how you engage with a variety of information and communications technologies to coordinate work across geographical space, possibly by being parts of teams of people that are spaced all over the world, you know, this is an increasingly important skill, including for us. I'm doing work with people in Norway at the moment. And yeah, I get to go to Norway now and again, and it's very nice. But most of our interactions are done with email and, and online and Skype and so on. So the kinds of broad and also specific informational practices that are taking place are quite different in each workplace setting. And how we develop people 
in people the capacity to build practices and configure their informational environments in this variety of different settings I think is a very important part of what we're trying to do and that's what I'm interested in essentially. So. A lot of you know where I go, you, you know I go walking in the Lake District every month or so, right? I've got to get to the Lake District every month or I start feeling itchy. So here is a picture of a very nice part of the Lake District. This is Borrowdale in the Lake District, very beautiful. Why have I put a picture of Borrowdale up? Because this idea of the digital habitat, this idea of an information landscape indeed, which for our purposes today we can consider as very similar ideas, and I think they are. The Lake District is a beautiful landscape for certain, but that verdant green valley, you know, that wasn't just left there when the glaciers rolled back 10,000 years ago. You know, if you go to uncultivated Lake District valleys, they're, they're swamps. You want to see what one of those looks like, go to a place called Crookdale, and you can really see what it looks like. You know, it's just a gigantic swamp. Agriculture, you know, is something that has stewarded and optimised Oops, the landscape. Too many clicks. All right, it is. It has been nurtured. It has been optimised. It has been looked after. There have been a variety of caring processes that have taken place. Small moves in the agricultural and the ecological scheme of things, but that landscape is one that has is now much more fertile and much more generative of capital, generative of of products. I mean, we could point to any agricultural landscape, and you know, generally humanity sometimes makes a bit of a mess of landscapes, that is true, but not always, and the Lake District, I think, is a good example of one. And that gentleman, Etienne Wenger, is going to be familiar to some of you as well, because in 2009, as part of, a, or an offshoot, if you like, of his work on communities of practice, the idea of, you know, social theories of learning, how people work together to fulfil their learning needs, I am simplifying greatly, I know, but time is short. He did, however, publish in 2009 a book with two other authors called Nancy White and John Smith, who were both very much practitioners. And it's a practitioner-oriented book, this book called Digital Habitats. And in that book, White, uh, sorry, Wenger, White and Smith describe this notion of a technology steward or technology stewardship. And it's, in essence, technology stewardship for these authors is what communities do, the, the series of actions that they undertake to build around them a technological environment that supports their mutual learning needs. And for Wenger et al, this is very important. That's a quote from them. It is, as they say, a creative process facilitating a community's emergence and growth. I mean, stewardship for Wenger et al is something that is often quite a formal thing. It is, it is involves people buying technologies, you know, selecting what would be the best technology to install in a particular environment or to fulfill a particular learning need or, and, and how to configure it vis-a-vis -vis other technologies. Who looks after it? Who moderates a, a discussion group or an online virtual forum? You know, these, these stewardship roles can often be quite formalised and quite overt, you know, people know who you have to go to if you want a problem fixed. I go to Peter, there he is, way at the back, Peter. Peter's clearly a technology steward for, for MIE, right? In, in a lot of ways, we, are, we act as technology stewards to some extent for our students. I mean, this is an important point. You know, we create environments in which we've made selections of resources. We have said, here is a reading list, here is a syllabus. Now here are some communications tools, here, here are some web pages and websites. You know, all these informational resources have been collected together in a landscape that in essence we've, we've designed. But a lot of the time, of course, this technology stewardship role is, number one, not so formalised, it's not so clear cut. It happened, people decide what technologies they're going to apply in a given communicative situation or a given learning situation, not because anybody's had an overt discussion about it, but simply because we used this last time, or, oh, I could, let's try this one. You know, it's often very informal, and, and these things are not necessarily um, brought into conscious awareness. 
And on top of that, of course, stewardship, and this is very much, again, Wenger et al. talking, that is also about an educational role. There is an educational element to it. How do you develop the capacity for stewarding in members of the community or in whatever group of learners it is, whether in a workplace or in a higher education setting, that you are trying to help to configure and manage and steward this technological and informational environment around them? How do you develop this capacity? Because for Wenger et al, this is what a good steward does. And I quote myself here, it says 2012, I don't even remember where I wrote this, but I must have written it somewhere. Um, the, the blue text is the one I'm important here, I think. The digital habitat should therefore not just facilitate use of the habitat, but participation in the ongoing learning processes which continuously shape the resources available to the community. This, this is what I think, how we should start to see teaching for the development of good information practices. You know, if we can get students to participate in the ongoing creation of the digital environment or digital habitat that is available to them, then I think that we have, we, we are teaching effectively and we're teaching for employability. And what becomes interesting in research terms is that if you think about that landscape that I just showed you, the Lake District, and you're a, you know, a geologist or geographer or an, uh, somebody with even a basic knowledge of these processes, you, know, you can read the forces, you can get a sense of the forces that have shaped a landscape. In the Lake District case, you know, um, glaciation, erosion, farming, and so on. If you take Wenger's, Wenger et al's ideas to a certain point and you, you start to see information landscapes as an accumulation of judgments, I think what we can potentially do is look at how the dialogues that have shaped a particular landscape and taken place within a particular community of practice, how these dialogues have ultimately shaped the digital habitat and the resources that are available I think is a very interesting research question so that's what we set out to look at but there are problems getting data on this which I think is why Wenger et al's ideas about stewarding although they're very interesting haven't been taken forward a lot in subsequent research there's not a lot of research that has subsequently cited those ideas and it remains mainly something that is written about in terms of practice so you know, I'm interested in learning to see and capturing these things. That guy Saratchevich, I just quote there because he did three excellent literature reviews on the topic of relevance and how people make judgments about relevance. And he said these things, these things are difficult to capture in, if you like, their natural habitat. Firstly, because of the good old-fashioned Hawthorne effect. If you're observing somebody you risk changing their behavioral dynamics. People won't necessarily act normally when they know they're being observed or if, and they know they're in an observational situation. I mean, it's not an unfathomable problem in research, of course, but it is a, it is a well-known one. Secondly, because it's actually difficult often to record these judgments as they happen. It's quite easy to ask people about them afterwards. I mean, it's easier. But if you do ask people about things after the fact, then, you know, there's a generally some kind of cognitive bias comes into play. We are, we are, for example, more likely to offer recollections of things that present us in a good light. We are more likely to present uh, success as our own and blame others for failure. There are plenty of other such cognitive biases in the world. And generally, you know, the picture of any past activity offered to interviewees is, in is inevitably mediated and not necessarily reliable. Ask any copper if you can get a conviction based only on eyewitness evidence. This is not going to happen. Right? It's certainly not very reliable. So a lot of work that is done on information practices is where people have been asked after the fact to try and say, why did you make these judgments? And I just think, you know, there's a little bit of, there's bias comes into play there. And Saratchevich finally also points out that, are you on that picture, I think, Hussain? <laughs> there you go, we're in the background there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my students from two years ago. Saratchevich says, look, a lot of this work that has been done to try and derive 
criteria by which learners in a given situation are developing information practices and learning about how to make judgments about information and technology are done in artificial situations. You know, people are given fake tasks often or simulated tasks, you know, non, non real ones. Plus, as I've said, the issue of whether the tasks that we can give them in higher education are transferable, you know, creating skills in ways that are transferable across to the workplace anyway. So there is, a, if you like, a second potential level of artificiality. I think, just for the sake, of, well not for the sake of argument because it's an important part of our argument, but I think that what gives student learning authenticity though is when the task is graded. And this might be a something that traditionalists or those who believe in the sort of moral principles of education might turn their noses up a bit a little. But I do think that in the end, if we give students a grade, then that is something that they have come to university to get. And so I do think that gives the task certain authenticity because I do believe that most students want to get the best grade they can. So we take the view in this research that as the task is oriented towards assessment that it is an authentic task and students want to succeed at it because they want a good grade. So that is our way of getting around that one. So look, yes, the data that we're looking at here is drawn from a, well, taught postgraduate course, mine specifically, which over the two years of this study from 2015 and 16 cohorts and last year's 2016 to 17 cohorts, I think we got a total of about 120 students. So it averaged out about 60 students a year. There were slightly more in the second year. It is worth saying briefly, but this does form a bigger part of Lee's research, his ED research, but it, it does um, bring distance learners and on-campus learners into the same spaces and they work together on a series of three online discussion activities which use the Blackboard discussion boards on the Blackboard VLE and I will say a bit more about what these are in a bit but it is those, it is the record of those online discussion boards that we are drawing on in order to look at how the students are developing information practices over the course of an academic year. I've said that kind of thing. It's worth saying then that what we have here is a situation where if you like I have given the students a starter digital habitat. Okay, I've, I've set up the course in ways that are the same for every student each year and they are split into groups which I'll say a bit more about in a second. And each of these groups begins, if you like, in September, October with, with, with a starter digital habitat that I've set up. But what happens over the course of, of these three learning activities, which increase in complexity over the year, is that through this work they get the chance to reconfigure this habitat, to alter it, to bring in their own informational resources and to make judgments about what information is useful to them and fulfilling the tasks and indeed what technologies should be brought in in order to enhance the ones that I have given them. Now this does give rise to a whole series of questions about power but I'm going to come back to that because of course that was the title of today's presentation so I haven't forgotten about it. I'm coming back to it. Very briefly what these activities are, I do want to say this quickly but not in excessive detail, but it is worth saying that these activities increase in complexity over the year. So the first one where I involve myself a lot, I am very present as moderator, I do uh, I have a lot of engagement with the students in these groups, is just um, discuss an academic text. They're provided with a text and some questions they might like to consider and, and off they go and do it. And I give them a lot of formative feedback. There's a lot of moderation. I have a teaching assistant helping out and you know they are helped through this process. But that moderation, that scaffolding is progressively withdrawn as the task increases in complexity. So once you get to the second task, the students are being expected to work to think about the divisions of labour in the group, to work more on scheduling the task they need. It's a more complex task, it's a role-playing simulation activity. They have to make a decision about educational technology in a simulated scenario. But they're still given all the information they need. So it is a more complex task logistically and there's more things they need to coordinate and think about and schedule 
but they're still given all the information they need. In the final task, they are asked to create or at least propose the design for new technological applications in a couple of educational settings, specifically museums. Hence the picture of last year's students at the National Football Museum, which is the one I take them to in Manchester, and each group has to attend to the design for another museum as well, one they haven't visited because that's where the distance learners have gone. So that's just why that's there. That's the Baths of Caracalla in Rome, which if you've ever been to Rome and got fed up about how many tourists there are everywhere, go to the Baths of Caracalla because there's nobody there and it's this monumental place. We get a lot of different museums in this second activity. They're just a couple more that have come up down the years. And the point of making that observation is that this shows that in order to succeed at all of these tasks, what the students need to do first of all is communicate experience of different contexts to their fellow students. They need to make collective judgments about the relevance of particular technologies, of particular sources of information and generally create around them a digital habitat that supports their learning needs in this case. Because yes, they get a starter habitat from me but they need to bring in their own resources independently, particularly in the third activity, by which time I am not moderating it at all. I leave them to it. The teaching assistant helps a bit. So across these two years of discussion groups, in which we had 20 discussion groups in total of five to seven learners each, we've got a massive data set that has recorded on the spot and hopefully without too much Hawthorne effect, although there's some to do with the fact that it's assessed, and I will come back to that that record the judgments and decisions that were made and collectively validated by the discussion and the dialogue taking place within these boards. And it's very interesting. Here is a sample. This is just an everyday piece of conversation. There are probably dozens like this that I could have picked, but here's one. So, Let's just look at what is actually being said here. So I've anonymised student names, so this is student W, and so the first thing student W s says is he's responding to an earlier post by student A, who has basically said, well, I think we should do this in the National Football Museum. Here's what we should do. But student W is a distance learning student, so he couldn't come to the National Football Museum. He's gone to another museum in Johannesburg because he's from South Africa. So the Origins Museum, I think, is about origins of humanity. Anyway. He said, right, you know, I think it's a nice suggestion for the first app. Uh, let's hear a few more. Let's come to a decision by Thursday, Tuesday, 6 p.m. I've got, I think I missed off a word somehow there, but I have suggestions for a second museum. I visited the Origin Centre in Johannesburg. You can view it at this website. Now, that's just, uh, that seems on the surface to be a very simple set of claims or just everyday conversation, but there's a lot going on here for a start. They know that by the time to get to the third activity, it's quite complex. They've only got two weeks. They've got to get a lot done. They've got to schedule their time. There are students who are distance learners. They live in different time zones. They're part-time students. They've got to coordinate their work. He's suggesting, you know, let's fix a schedule here. He validates student A's prior suggestion for something that they could look at by saying nice suggestions and in turn says, oh, here's a source of information that you can go to to find out more about the context that I would like to talk about, in other words, the Origin Centre, because I need to educate you guys, the rest of my group, about what is in this centre, in order that we can propose a design for this potentially and everybody gets a good mark and we meet the instrumental goals of this activity. That's all un unspoken, but it's definitely there. And it's, he could have done something else, just in the top one of those posts. Student B says, I'm an on-site student, I'm going to share some pictures I have taken. Apologies for her grammar. It's a quite different thing to share information about a museum by directing somebody to the website than it is to share information about a museum by showing them photos that you took when you went there. They're both useful and they're, they're different. So. Student B has introduced different resources into the information landscape. This is the same group, by the way. This is all from the same group. So student B has introduced different resources into this landscape. Could have chosen to say, here's the, here's the website, but says here are these 
informational resources that I have created. These are my pictures. This is my story about what I found in this museum. I want to share it with you. Student A comes back to student W and says, I like W's suggestion about the Origins Museum. Again, validating his suggestion, validating his idea that this is a direction we should take our learning. I have checked the website. It's, you know, she's, she's saying, yeah, thanks for that source of information, student W. There's an implicit acknowledgement there of the usefulness of this resource. And she's basically saying, hey, other students, you know, it's worth having a look at this website. It's, there's some interesting stuff on here. Goes on and says, yeah, that she wants to work with virtual reality. She says, I suggest the idea about virtual reality to be with this museum. We can, and um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now that's just a normal exchange, that happened quite quickly. But through that it's just a typical example of how these practices have been introduced by students, probably without really thinking about it, how they have been validated by other students and how these have moved them forward in this learning and design task. That was quite a simple example. Here's, here's a more complicated example, and, and this is where we start getting into these questions of power and resistance here, which I think are most interesting. Because they are not constrained by the technological environment that I have created for them. In other words, Blackboard and its discussion boards. Now, those of us who have used Blackboard a lot, I don't know what you all think about it. I've learned to tolerate it down the years. It's tolerable, and I've learned what it can do and what it's not very good at, and I don't get it to do the things it's not very good at. But it took me a while. I tolerate Blackboard's discussion boards because there are certain advantages to my using them, and the students know this, and well, as we'll see in a minute, I, I have given them guidance that says, look, my information practices are such that I can't go chasing around the internet to find your discussions in order to grade them. So I'm quite clear to them and I say, whatever's on the board will be graded, but I'm not going to look at other things off the board. However, I do understand that students, almost every group of students down the years, finds another way to interact beyond the Blackboard discussion boards, whether it's setting up a Facebook discussion group. I mean, I, dis I, I, I remind them of the need to include distance learning students. So I say, look, don't go and have your, you know, dis substantive discussions around the tea room in the Adam Wilkinson building because you'll omit to involve your partners. I want you to learn about how to use technologies like this to coordinate work across geographical boundaries. And I'm trying to fit in with my own information practices, so I want you to use the boards. But I they all bring in other technologies. They're all stewarding the digital habitat. And this is a good example of it. This particular group, so this is the 2015-16 cohort, the white group, they all have colour codes. In the first activity, they did the activity and made their own informal judgments about the quality of the environment here. Because in the second activity, student J, who was bringing this interest and awareness in from her own professional practice, said, I think we should use a wiki. I'm gonna, I'd rather we used a wiki. A wiki would be better. So in activity two, they used a wiki. But here we are in activity three, and pretty much immediately on day one of the activity, student J says, being very pro-wiki, I have created four wikis now to help us with this project. So she's basically saying, look, we, we did all right with wikis last time, didn't we? Let's use them again. I don't know why they needed four either, but <laughs> there were probably reasons. And student S, one of another group member within very quickly, and around midnight, I would add, um, validates this judgment by saying, I think the wikis are very reasonable and feasible, but what does he mean here? I think wikis just assist us in finishing our designs. We may not need to put massive efforts on wikis, but it helps us to build ideas. I know that's a bit of a confusing sentence out of context, but what he actually is saying there, as was revealed by the next bit of that quote, is... He's, he draws attention then to the student, to, draws the student's attention to what I have said, and everything after one final point though is, is a quote from me that he has lifted directly from the guidance, the general guidance given to students about these activities, where I say, look, you can go off and use other tools if you like, but I want summaries of your discussions on these other tools back on the boards, otherwise I can't mark them. And student S has has you know, validated the suggestion to use a wiki, but he's drawn his colleagues' attention back 
to, a, to constraints that have been imposed on their creation of the digital habitat in this case. I mean, I'm skipping over some of these more complex points, but that's basically what's gone on there. And student C, who goes on and, and is now replying to student J setting up the wiki, says, thanks for this, J. And I like that phrase at the end of that first paragraph, not only do you like a good wiki, we all like a good wiki now. She's acknowledging how student J's interest in wikis has introduced new technological possibilities into this particular group's digital habitat. And she goes on to say, and it's, you know, how, how many times have we all been here? However, can I ask you how you do the colour for the text? I tried last time and never succeeded. If I'm going to be green, <laughs> I need to sort that out now. I would add that student C is a professor and has a doctorate in biochemistry. All right? And she's just acknowledging, as you do, look, I'm not sure about how to use some of this technology. So student J doesn't patronise or laugh. She says, oh, no worries, and tells her how to change the colour of the text. This is stewarding as education. Student J has now taken on the role here of saying not only would I like us to use wikis but I acknowledge your claim of lack of expertise here and I'm going to give you a little bit of coaching. And that will happen very spontaneously on the boards with certainly without me having to take on that responsibility and certainly without me having anything to do with it. In fact these are spontaneously emerging dialogues on the board. So all right so far, but it doesn't end there. Student J has crisis of confidence with about two days to go. I mean, I'm not going to you know, read all that out, but student J, again prompted by a reminder that, you know Drew will only mark stuff that's on the board, has worries and says, look, I'm, I'm worried. She panics. And I would say, by the way, there was no need for her to do so because they'd done very well to summarise their discussion on the board, but nevertheless, student J panics and that red text, which I know is not necessarily easy to read, is actually her colour coding. You know, she posted all of this stuff from the wiki back onto the discussion boards with colour coding in place. So, ostensibly, I could tell who had written what and could give them the marks. So she's going back and readjusting all those information practices that they developed in the first place and trying to make them fit to what they perceive as the information practices that are valued and validated in this setting by me the tutor and by proxy the institution and this is where this guy comes in I love Michel Foucault's look by the way I think he looks so much like a philosopher it's untrue I wish I could look like this guy well I mean I could look like this guy if I just shaved my head and put sunglasses on I suppose but hey, I think I've quite got the ears Foucault has some very interesting things to say here about power and what power is that I think help explain what is happening here because I think I've got about what 10 11 minutes left I'd better get on to these points where I'm talking about power and resistance in online learning because this is what we're seeing here the point about Foucault's view of power is that in Foucault's view power is not something that is that is simply asserted or, or the the possession of the powerful as we would traditionally define them in society, whether that be governments, politicians, you know, the military, um, or senior managers in institution, or indeed the power of teachers over students. It's not simply something that's top-down, and it's not simply something that oppresses. For Foucault, power is more like this kind of power. You know, electrical power. It's there, and yet, it has to be generated, you know, there's, there are certain ways that you have to set up a kind of discursive environment in order that power be flowing through that environment, but that power can then be asserted, it's asserted at the micro level of discourse, it's generated by discussion and discourse in various ways. And yes, it can be dominating, yes. And certainly when we are looking at how, I mean, I probably should skip on a bit because I'm starting to run out of time but when you're seeing these students create their own digital habitat you know they're doing so within if you like the constraints that have been set for them by the parameters of the activity and by all of the ways that they read the starter habitat that I give them for clues as to what I want from them in order to give them a better mark and that there's a kind of proxy version of me in this setting 
that disciplines the students and even when I'm not there students are disciplining not only themselves but they're disciplining each other and this kind of idea comes very much from Foucault's ideas I know I'm glossing over Foucault but again time sorry this is from interview these are the leaded interviews with some of the students not me because of the power issue but leaded them and what we have here is an example of where these students are saying hey we set up a Facebook group specifically so we could have discussions without Drew reading them so you know they were resisting the power there and saying we want to set up a Facebook group because we know that anything we say on the blackboard discussion boards will be graded we want to have discussions that aren't graded so and we don't want Drew to be party to them so we're going to set up a Facebook group which they did and then use that Facebook group anyway to discipline fellow students for not participating <laughs> That, that is self-disciplinary power right there. You know, they are, they are conforming each other, making each other conform to what they perceive as my demands. But it is a perception. I'm not there in that third activity. I'm only there by proxy. I'm like that, that's me, that's my empty seat, my little flag. You know, I'm there as a kind of, <laughs> you know, titular presence. But I'm not actually there. I know I am there as a, as a discourse, I am there as a proxy, but that's the point. How each of these different groups perceived the power in this environment and the ways that they therefore needed to make their choices of technology and informational resource conform to that power differed from group to group. You know, it's not some objective reality of power, it is an interpreted and a constructed power. And each group perceives this slightly differently. I mean, there's so much more to say about power and authority in these settings anyway, but we, we've got a lot of data on this. But it's when, stu I mean, the other point about Foucault and his view of power is how important it is to remember that resistance to power is, is, a, is bound up with this power. Power is not you know, irresistible. It's not something that definitely gets you exactly what you want if you assert it in a social situation. Power is so complex. There is so much resistance to power. Power can guide and cajole and coerce and even sanction and so on. But it, you know, we're not robots. We cannot be simply reprogrammed. And this Foucault's view of power is that without resistance to power, there is no power. It is in resistance to power that these students are really learning and really asserting their ability to create their own digital habitat and learn these information practices that I want them to learn in the first place. You know, they are saying, well, we don't like the VLE. We're going to bring in Gmail or Google Drive or Facebook or all of these other technologies. And it's not that this is exactly the kind of independent learning that I want students to assert, but I'm not, you know, it's a contradiction in terms to say that I've told them to do it. The resistance that is coming up here, you know, is very well illustrated by the wiki case, the complexity of that case in that particular group where, you know, they knew they wanted to use a different technology. They knew they it would help them meet their information and learning needs. And yet, at the last moment, they still decided to, if you like, come back out of that technology and unnecessarily put everything else back in the group in order to conform to what they saw as my information needs and practices. So I think what we see in this data are some very complex interplays of power and resistance that are essential to this task fulfilling its learning objectives. This is why assessment I think is so important here because if I didn't assess these practices and these interactions then there would be no need to make them visible to me at all. And so this visibility, this, this need to put things on the board is why I said that I can't claim that we have somehow eradicated the Hawthorne effect. But the Hawthorne effect is not a factor of my uh, research in this, it's a factor of my grading it as a tutor. They're not necessarily, I mean we had students in interview who said, oh I really didn't like this guy in my group, you know, I just, but every time he posted something I would just put smile, I agree, mm -hmm. because I didn't want to have an argument with him. Right, so what is going on the boards is not necessarily what they really feel. But it is important to say that without that visibility, not only are, am I unable to grade them, but more importantly, the students are not getting the chance to scrutinise the way that they are making judgments about technology. 
This is not the only assessment on this course unit. There is a final assessment after all of these activities are done and in that they are asked to evaluate their practice in the course. And you know, people do write about these activities and it is a way of saying reflecting on the ways that they have learned to engage with different technologies and different information practices and I think to do so in ways that are much more able to be taken forward into workplace settings because this what I think they have done is learned to steward they've learned to steward and they're learning it in a practical situation where there are real objective benefits to them doing it so going back to the guy with the bald head. Kendall and Wickham's very good um, discussion of Foucault's methods, this is what this is drawn from, but they are talking about Foucault's work himself. It is often said that Foucault says that power and knowledge are the same thing in his book Power Knowledge, 1980. And he kind of does. But Kendall and Wickham are right to say that you can't simply claim in Foucault that they are the same thing. It's a vulgar reading of Foucault, they say, to claim that he said that. This is what they say he actually said, and I think this is very interesting. Power is non-stratified, local, unstable and flexible, whereas knowledge is stratified, stable and segmented. I know that's complex, but what does that mean? If you imagine then that the pedagogical design of this particular setting has created an environment in which power is flowing through it, but in you know, a kind of flux, in an unstable and flexible way, and that these activities have given the students the ability to draw on this power and from that power to coalesce new information practices and an awareness of how they can, in their own environment, empower themselves to better sustain and steward their technological and informational environments in ways that are going to go on and help them in subsequent professional practice, then I think, you know, there is some validity to that claim. I think what we see in this data, and we are still working our way through it, this is still very much work in progress, but I think what we're seeing are those embryonic moments where proto-communities of practice are forming. They're probably not full communities of practice because there's no requirement for sustained engagement after the course is finished, but they're certainly proto-communities of practice, I think. And there are proto-practices and proto-hierarchies evolving in these different groups in different ways. And it's been very interesting to look at how these different groups are engaging in dialogue with each other in ways that they're probably not consciously aware of but that their practices are coalescing out of this flux of power that is being created by the dialogue in these given settings. You know, they're learning, where's my arrow key, they're learning how to use a range of technological tools and to select them, to configure them, to communicate their benefits and also their problems to other members of the group, to educate other members of the group in the necessary practices if necessary and to do this in an environment that rather than just being a random set of practices has some direction to it because it's oriented to them getting a good grade. So there is an authenticity to these practices I think. And I think those are the kinds of things that we've seen. I am interested in how we can enfold if you like teaching for and assessment for employability into our work in higher education in a more integrated way than it's typically done. And I think what we're seeing in this data are some very interesting things about how students respond to that and what the outcomes of this type of practice development are. I think that, you know, I'm very keen to um, think about how we can support communities of learners to do this kind of thing, but also at the same time recognising and and trying to foreground the ways in which power is invested in these environments, both my and by proxy the institution's power, but also the ways that students can become empowered in this setting. And I think it's largely through you know, resistance, it's when students resist my power as the tutor that I think the more interesting things are happening in terms of how students develop these kinds of practices in ways that they can take forward into their final, into their future employment, whatever that may be. So I've left time for questions, good on me, I don't always. Um.
I mean, that, that's all I have to say. I mean, that was, there's a thank you slide. But look, if it's time for questions, and if anybody wants to ask any. Well, my colleagues at the back think about this thing as we've been working together for years, and now you know what I've been doing. <laughs> yes, Mike, hello. Because I've kind of been... You have been, yes. Several of you have or are going to be so part of this. To kind of understand what your methods were. Yeah. In terms of when people did go out of the space, Yes. Did you see that as a as a as a positive thing? Absolutely, hundred percent. So, yeah. and this is not happening. Was they marked on that as well? Well, I wanted them to post summaries. If I said to them, look, if you go out and, and say have an Adobe Connect meeting, because some of them said, look, we don't like. Con why should we just? post on the boards you know the boards are clunky it takes us ages to find them why don't we all just have a have an adobe connect meeting and talk about this and a lot of them did and will do this year some of you are doing this this year you're going to do this kind of thing it's going to happen but i said look i if you're t if you're discussing substantive things in this meeting then you need to have a summarizer put the minutes of your meeting on the board and that is something I will then take account of. You know, I will be able to see how you have developed your discussion in this meeting. So, yeah, I wholeheartedly encourage them to bring in these other artifacts, these other resources. But I, you know, my power, if you like, my, you know, my own information practice needed to be helped out here because, you know, I wasn't going to sit and watch a recording of a meeting. No offence. So. You know, this was specified, but I think also, you know, students, students recognised, I mean, you, you tell me, I mean, I think students recognised what was going on here to some extent and mostly were happy to do it. Lee's interviews were interesting here in that he, you know, students generally, I think, were quite happy with this and the, the, the things that they complained about a bit in interviews were often, you know, they didn't like via Lee discussion boards they were clunky they but the, you know well, I wouldn't suggest that um, having done it a few years ago I would suggest we as a, those group meetings were because um, you told us that we can go and out and I told you you could I didn't tell yeah. you you should yeah exactly yes, <laughs> it was because the environment didn't work for us yeah. and we wanted to do, use it in a way that it did work very very few people though very very few groups did this kind of thing in the first activity. And that's the interesting thing here. The interesting thing, I mean, most of the, if not all of the examples I was giving you there, now I think about it, were probably from the third activity. But very few groups did it in the first activity. Even the wonderfully pro-wiki 15 white group didn't do it in the first activity. Because I think, you know, the, in the first activity, students are much more sensitive. They're feeling their way. They're not as confident. They're worried about me, personally. I give them a lot of formative feedback though, I mean it's a very important part of this particular activity that they get formative feedback at the end of the first activity and indeed the end of the second activity. So by the third I think they were a lot more confident and I think you see a lot more of this in the final activities, that they're more confident about bringing in these other things. It's fear of failure, frankly, that stops them doing it in the first until they are, they are encouraged to see that it's okay. I think. But that's you know, how it links to the research in terms of Again, that's that's an operation of power. It takes people a while to resist the power. Oh, yeah. In on these boards, yeah. well, they get a marking rubric. They get, they get a marking rubric. They can see the rubric. The rubric is public knowledge. So yeah. there are plenty. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. There's plenty of things in this environment that. For the, the starter habitat, this idea of a starter digital habitat, the resources and the information and the construction and the structuring of the information and the technologies that are supplied to the students at the start of the course, it's not some neutral inert space. It's shot through with power and authority, mine mainly. Or, or as I said, the, uh, uh, I am seen as... I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, guys, but you see us as, you, know, you don't see institutional power, you see your teacher, I think. You see your tutor. You know we're marking you. And there's a lot of 
complexity in, in the discourse here because at the same time as acknowledging entirely the power relationships that exist in this environment, I of course want students generally to transcend my structuring of their learning environment. We want students to read independently. We want them to go and find stuff, particularly at master's level which is not on the reading list. We want them to be engaging in inquiries that are independently motivated. We don't want you guys to ask us what to think. You, we want to teach you how to think. And there is a complex dynamic going on here between students, I think, largely recognizing that's the case, but still knowing that the power relationship is there. Drew or Gary or Susan or whomever is marking their work, what do they want from me? The student asks. What I'm trying this year is I'm actually trying to get the students to mark their own work. Woo, um, okay. Sort of you ready for that, guys? No, this is not, this is an undergraduate course. Oh, I see, right, okay. Um, so that's something that I'm trying, I've done it in the past, but so actually getting people to look at rubrics, think about you know, what it means, what are we looking for, and then actually do their own initial marking. I've considered it on this course. That's Consider. what I don't know how, to go at. I don't know how successful. When I, when I told them that last week, the look of shock horror. Well, yeah. Interesting idea though. Interesting idea. So, yeah, sorry, I don't know if I really answered your question at all. But yeah, I suppose I was thinking more abstractly, is, is it just your, I was trying, trying to think, you know, there's something about people de desiring the thing that they believe that you desire. Yes, so I think that very much happens. Yeah. In. But I wonder if it's what you decide, it's, it's, it's what they imagine. And, but I'm just wondering if it is about your opinion, or if it is, you know, but, but I'm trying to think what, what's then structures that almost that stereotype. Oh, well, it's, it's such a complex question. And I mean, and I'm wondering yeah. if it is yeah. just you, you know, like if, if you're replaced by someone else who had ideas change or if you don't exist. And, <laughs> Well, deep philosophy. So what we need, yeah, let's get the road, what, what yeah, let's get the craft work version of Drew. <laughs> well, I think that happens. I don't know your, I don't know your name. I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Nancy. I, I think that happens, Nancy, and that's, that's why I think that it's, yeah. But I guess, I guess what our data are trying to reveal, or I, I think what we're trying to reveal from the data and what we've seen in the data is the point that, you know, even when I am not, or, and, and, the, and by the third activity, even my teaching assistant, who varies year on year, by the way, but um, whoever it is, the, the teaching assistant in the third activity is only, um, she's just there to look for major problems. I mean, by, we, we largely leave them to it. And I stay out of the boards in the third activity. And yet, I'm still present and there's still versions of me and my, my dialogue, my, my, my implicit presence is very visible on these boards despite the fact that I'm not actively present in the dialogue. And it's there through other moves in dialogue that have been made like the guidance that I've given them, like the marking rubric, like the reading list, you know? I mean, it is, a good, it is a good sign, as far as I'm concerned, when students do actually put in their bibliography stuff that's on the reading list, because it's a sign that they've looked at the reading list. There you go, there's some free advice for you guys, okay? <laughs> if I ask you to read something, you know, it's probably a sign that I think it's important. But, I get, yeah, I mean, and that, that I suppose is the point that I'm trying to get to today, the, int the interesting uh, examples of learning, of where the, the dialogues that we've recorded really show new, new information practices developing in the students, is precisely when they resist that power and, and do question what I've said I wanted and are prepared to do things that I've not explicitly said do this and do make their own decisions about resources instead of just sticking to the ones that I've given them and that's that's the interesting but slightly paradoxical thing that I think we're trying to get to here that you can design environments in ways that acknowledge institutional power over information practice but at the same time allow that power to be also be drawn upon by the students. I haven't had time to say anything today about how hierarchies, we, we've seen hierarchies develop in these groups. 
you know, if you like, from a, from a standing start or from nothing hierarchy by the end of activity three, you know, different people have taken on a management role. They've become the manager of the group. Nobody assigned that role to them, but it, it emerges. You know, pe people are getting the chance to bring in things from their own professional contexts and other students who may feel less confident about that context or simply recognise the authority. It's like people recognise the authority of, of student J. Student J is a full-time teacher doing the course of distance learning and student C, as I've already said, is a noted professor in biochemistry. And, you know, C nevertheless deferred to J's authority in, in that case. So J had developed an authority within uh, you know, a proto-hierarchy that had emerged in this group that did not exist, could not have existed before Activity 1. And it's very interesting to see how these things are emerging in ways that actually have nothing to do with directly my discursive and administrative power in this setting. They are emerging because there is power in this setting. And it's not being wielded by me in some oppressive sense. It is, a, it is Foucault's view of, of power, I think, as something that is generated through the discourse in the setting. And that's what's been really interesting from this work so far. Anyway. Hi, so we. So, I get what you're do, do people mind if we carry on, by the way? We are a bit over time. We're supposed to finish at five, right? Yeah, we'll carry on. Go on, Sylvie, go on. Um, so, I get what you're saying about the autonomy. Um, students exerting some kind of control over their own environments. Yes. Um, it's all right, Linda. See you arguing later. That, um, it's in the resistance that we see information practices emerging. Does that mean that conformity doesn't constitute information practice? And is it really resistance if this is consonant with more aims and objectives for the module? It's a fair point, and um, worth considering. Um, yeah, I mean, sure, I think there's a certain amount of practices do emerge. You know, students, students learn how to fulfill, collectively fulfill the requirements of the marking rubric, amongst other things. So yes. But I still think there are elements of resistance to that because, why have I said that? Um, they find their own ways to do it and they find ways to do it that I think are based you know, on their perception of, of what will work. I've given, I've given them feedback, you know, I give them feedback at the end of activity one, plenty of feedback. And yeah, you know, I, I expect them to conform to suggestions made in that feedback, that's true. And if they do, then I'll give them credit for that in my later feedback, you know, in my more summative feedback. I say, well done for responding to the things I said. So yeah, I guess you're right. I guess there is a certain amount of ways in which they learn to conform and through learning to conform are able to create practices. But I think there's still a very complex kind of boundary interaction going on here and a lot of stuff going on under the radar that is, is not necessarily visible until that moment at which things get posted on the board and they become visible and, and yeah so I guess there's a bit of what you've said but I think there's a lot that's not that okay does that make sense so I, yes you're right so let's say most of the practices are emerging from resistance and some are emerging from conformity I think but I'd have to look at that more closely but thank you Hey, Gary. Just a quick follow on. I mean, in a sense, you know, <coughs> what, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're taking what, what are people's existing practices, which may come from a whole variety of spaces and places, and we're trying to get them to conform in a new way. In a way in, 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 we're trying to say you're talking about work in a way you know, that's kind of nebulous in a sense because we've got such a mixed group potentially in a class, although it depends on the course you're teaching, I suppose, to some extent. But, but in reality, uh, we're expecting them to conform because we want people to do research and we want people to write academic papers because that's allegedly why people do master's degrees. Uh, yeah. So isn't it what, kind isn't of. part of what we're trying to do to get people to conform in those kinds of ways? So you know, your feedback 
is about, it might be about a variety of different things, but if you look at the rubrics that we have, one of the rubrics is where you have to write references in the right kind of way. Well, yes, there are, there are a huge amount of ways in which we are trying to oblige students to engage with certain information practices, that's true. And I mean, I think, I guess that's what I was alluding to at the start of the presentation, where I say I think we've, a lot of work gets devoted to that in the study of information practice in higher education. You know, how we help people develop these kinds of academic information practices in ways that, exactly as you said, help them get good grades. Ultimately, be and able to become a researcher. Yes, I mean that—that that is that. Yes. Yes. But most of our MA students are not here because they want to become PhD students. You know, and and so you know, I think we're obliged to think about other forms of information practice as well. I, th I think it is a very complex dance is going on here between, as you say, the practices that students are bringing in and th then their identities, what they want from, from a degree at UK higher education at the time and afterwards, and institutional and administrative requirements that oblige us to think about teaching, think about grading, think about assessment and feedback in certain ways, and, and ultimately our, our more high level aims and objectives of a course, in, order, in, a, in other words, to develop independent thinkers, to develop good citizens, to develop people, at least on this course, who are able to design technologically based educational environments in, in you know, democratic and sustainable ways. I would say that's our ethos on the, on the MADTCE. So there is a very complex dance going on here and, and, and just generally I think this dance probably exists in every higher education course in the world. But it's not very really easy to see. And I think you know, that's what we're trying to see here is how these practices... I mean we, 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 we're seeing here I think communities of practice in embryo and practices you know emerging from this flux of of interactions on a course and I think that's what's been really interesting but yeah whether these practices are then oriented towards employability whether they're oriented towards transition to PGR whether they're oriented to you know schools I mean I, I'm not an expert on schools by any means but many of you DTCE students are or want to be school teachers for example and that's something you know, that, but at least with my teaching, I need to deal with that fact that I am not an expert in areas where people might want to develop relevant practices. So how all of these things come together in, in the kinds of interactions that are taking place and that are facilitated by the pedagogical design of this environment is a, is a very complex question. You know, we don't know enough about how students develop these kinds of practices. We, we're, we're not so bad at disciplinary knowledge, and a lot of work's gone into this. But you know, disciplinary knowledge is becoming, like it or not, less of a relevant factor in how students are going on to get jobs. So I think it's important we look at these things. But yeah, go on just saying, um, you, you were waving at me earlier. Uh, I participated in these network discussions. Yes, I know, the photographs of you doing it. Right? <laughs> Yes. I would like to mention about my experience on it as an overseas student. Okay. Uh, I also remember that I spent very long time for first activity because uh, I know that I was monitored by someone, you and your assistant. Yes. And uh, this, the feeling of being observed, may encourage me to be more. Uh, explicit, more uh, clear. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you said observation can change uh, people's yes. behaviors. Do you think this observation is a power in this? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that you say that because you imply that it might have changed your practice in positive ways or ma made you think about how you needed to express yourself more clearly, for yeah, example. Maybe more formal, for example. Yes, and I would say that is a desirable outcome. I would say that I do want, amongst other things, with this activity to help students, as I said, learn how to use these kinds of technologies to coordinate work tasks. 
So yeah, if I was encouraging you as a result of the visibility of the practice to, if you like, engage in more effective information practice in your own right, in other words, to express yourself more clearly to... I mean, there are, there are other things visible in these discourses, you know, encouraging students to end a contribution with a hook for another contribution, you know, instead of just saying, this is what I think, post, this is what I think, what do you guys think? You know, that kind of thing is a good, and that's what gets you grades, good grades, remember this as well, guys, it's in the marking rubric. So if I was encouraging you through the design of the activity and through the visibility of the debate and the discussion to engage in better information practice, as far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing. You know, and, 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 and you're helping meet the learning outcomes of the course. But it's a sign of where then the visibility of the practice, me making you post it on a board that you know is being observed, yeah. is leading to outcomes that might not necessarily be present if I just sent you all off as a purely on-campus project team and got you to come back two weeks later with a design for a proposal. That's an interesting point, I think. I guess we've got to finish. I've got to go and get a train anyway. Yeah. So, thank you very much. my pleasure. No, thank you. Thank I enjoyed you it. For walking an illuminating lecture. That's right. I think tomorrow I will roll with the resistance. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you.